Um, I'm actually pretty sure that most of you know more about equatorial waves than I do. I mean, you are in the S2S workshop, so this is not really. So if anything occurs to me, errors, um, please uh, tell me. Maybe, in fact, anyone, one of you could give a better presentation on that. But it could be good to remind us what these equatorial waves are. And I will, I will try to derive them according to the simple textbook of Holton in the most easy way possible, reducing the equations as much as possible and hitting very hard the real atmosphere by doing this. So what, is, what would be the, the motivation? If we, if we have a field near the equator, uh, let's say it could be a wind field or temperature, or I think what, what many people also use is the outgoing long wave radiation, because we have good measure, satellite measurements from the 1980s onward, whereas for all the other fields, the direct measurements in the, in the equatorial regions may be not so accurate over large parts. So if you do that, and imagine you have a field You have a field that, uh, let's say, velocity from x, y, and t. OK, we can look at the, at the variance of this field in spatial space and get some idea what's happening. But what is interesting to do is sometimes to do a spectral transform of this, to transform this into a field of the velocity, let's say, head, as a function of, and in this case, it's not actually a function of y. It's a function of the zonal wave number and the frequency, or we will call it nu. So we do a spectral transform, a Fourier transform into this space, and then analyze the, the variance of this, the square, essentially. If you do that in the tropical regions, and again, I guess everybody of you is more familiar with this diagram than I. Uh, so if you look at that, then you draw this energy in, in terms of the frequency nu and the, the wave number k, the zonal wave number in this case. We are averaging this field or summing the, the spectra around the equatorial region. Then something striking occurs to us. We can see some increased energy in some, in some bands in this, in this uh, wave number frequency region. And, and there are these kind of straight lines popping out here. And, and there are some other things appearing here. And of course, you know what these are. What, what, what are these? Carry waves. And, and what are these? You see, <laughs> I knew that you know better than. <laughs> so, uh, what is this here? This is the MJO. OK. And I guess this is something like mixed Rossby gravity waves or something like this. So, we. We may ask the question, so how, um, can we get a theoretical grip on these waves? Can we uh, try to understand them, their, uh, this power spectrum? Can we try to, to assess how, how we can maybe derive this a little bit from equations and then therefore maybe understand a little bit more uh, from this? just want to show you the... From my own work, this is a, this model that I'm, I'm running, outputs from this model. And um, here I'm doing something in this experiment. I'm uh, prescribing a sea surface temperature anomaly in the equatorial Atlantic in a, in a switch-on experiment. So, so I'm starting from, from I, I compare an experiment with a control experiment, and this anomaly is switched on. So at time zero, in this diagram, is, is shown the, the wind at upper levels, 200 hectopascal, average over about the equator. And time is running here in days. And here is the, the longitude. And we are here in the, in the Atlantic, zero. And at time zero, there is nothing, no perturbation in the fields. 
But then something is happening. The SST anomaly, the sea surface temperature anomaly, will create a heating in the atmosphere, and that will create waves. Somehow the heating at some point creates a vertical motion. This vertical motion hits the tropopause and uh, creates equatorial waves. All kinds of things, but also equatorial waves. And also here, if you follow these lines here, these moves to the, to the east, and these moves to the, to the west. But with different, as you can see, the phase speed could be derived by, by looking at this at the envelope here. And the phase speeds are very different. So what are these waves? We, we can also interpret them as, as, as some kind of waves. We want so these these would be again the Kelvin waves that move to the east, and these would be the the equatorial Rossby waves that we see here. In the model, their wave speed may not be exactly the uh, the ones that were observed, but something similar. Okay, so so these were the two two motivations for for deriving this. So this will be kind of a, this is kind of a it's a really a, a master level lecture, but I guess it's, it's anyway good to, to, to remind of us what is going on. So what, what, I, what I'm trying to do here is to derive these, these, these spectra in these waves using the shallow water model, which is the simplest model you can use to derive these waves. The shallow water model has almost nothing to do with the real atmosphere. Okay, because it assumes constant density, uh, no divergence, uh, many things, uh, uh, avert, uh, horizontal velocities that are independent of height, many things that are not true in the real atmosphere. Yet, this very simplified model can be used to derive some properties of these waves. Uh, there will be a problem coming back in the end because we're using, we're using in the shadow water models parameters that we have no idea what scale to, what, what, what number to put in these parameters. And these parameters, in the end, we will have to adjust according to the observed fa uh, phase velocities because we cannot really derive them from, from observations of this quantity because this quantity doesn't exist in the real world, in the real atmosphere. So, so again, these are the, the, the assumptions of this shallow water model, which is uh, really hitting the atmosphere extremely hard. But it's still surprising that the solutions of these equations are even, you know, we can derive something analytically, which is, which is the reason why we, we, we are trying to use these equations. And some of the solutions look like the observed uh, properties. At least, you know, we disregard the vertical structure. Uh, but still, the solutions are even more complicated than we would expect. This, the solution of these equations. So we assume that we have an incompressible fluid with a constant density. That the that the flow that we are considering is uh, is such that the horizontal velocities do not depend on height. This assumption is, of course, wrong in the tropics, in particularly. In the exotropic, sometimes you make this assumption. Some, we call this barotropic mode, or you find those kind of perturbations. In the tropics, this is usually exactly not the case. Particular, imagine the case of a heating in the tropics, and so induced heating. We get at a surface convergence, and at upper levels, divergence. So no way the horizontal velocities could be independent of height. So the, inter the interpretation of what we derive is then we interpret it to be valid not for the whole troposphere, but maybe either for the upper troposphere or for the lower troposphere. But in order to make a connection between the two, uh, one has to, to make some additions that, that, that will come back. Have you ever heard of the Gill model, the Gill response to an atmospheric heating? Uh, some of you have heard that. Also there, this, this problem, the, the model is based on the same equations, and this problem will come back very, very severely, because uh, in the Gill model we make the same assumptions that we do here. So this is very, very grave 
assumption. So essentially, we are starting with the, with the horizontal equations of motion and with the hydrostatic approximation. There's still no, nothing yet wrong about these equations because these, are, these equations are valid. Okay. Then, you remember if you do the, if you write down the continuity equation and you assume that the density is constant, this is the divergence-free equation, of course. Just to remind you, how do we derive the shallow water equations? We integrate the hydrostatic equation vertically from, a, from an arbitrary height to the top of the medium. So we assume that we actually have a, have a fluid that can change, which the height of the fluid can change, and variations of this height, gradients in this height, can then determine as flow within the fluid. That's the very simple assumption if we, if we use these equations. So, um, so what we get is we can transform the pressure gradient force with the hydrostatic equation in something that looks like this. The, the gradient of, the, of V times the height of our, of our shallow water. So if we insert this in the equations, okay, we get, we get this. So in principle, we are now we have, we have two equations, the two horizontal equations of motion. Uh, so by the way, what are, what, are the, what are the terms here? The local change of velocity. This is the advection of the, of the velocity. The pressure gradient term, we, we named this already. And the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force, of course, is interesting because uh, one may naively believe close to the equator it's zero, and therefore we can set this to zero. But it turns out that the Coriolis force is extremely relevant for the equatorial waves, too. So what we can do now is to, to use the divergence-free... Um, so, yeah, the problem is that we have two equations and three variables still, because there is this geopotential height or the height of the, of the medium that we, no, we need something else to close the system. And that, that is delivered by the continuity equation. Which again, we can integrate vertically and derive from this an equation for the height of our system. So the, the, the height here of our system fulfills uh, the continuity equation. So with this last equation, our set of equations, or our shallow water equations, uh, complete. And these equations, again, have nothing to do with the real atmosphere, but can be used to derive some properties of the real atmosphere. What we, of course, we would like to, to solve this equation, the set of equations, analytically, in order to understand something. We could integrate them numerically, starting with some initial conditions, or we could solve them. We want to, to solve, in order to understand a to get something like a dispersion relationship or something like this, we would like to solve these equations analytically. Of course, the problem is immediately these equations are nonlinear. We are kind of lucky because they are only non, non, really nonlinear in, in this advection term. So, what we usually do is we linearize these equations around a basic state in order to be able to solve them. Because nonlinear equations cannot, it's very difficult, very co uh, complex to solve analytically. So, so what we do is we linearize them around, and, we, and we, we make it very easy for us. We assume that the basic state has zero flow. Now, this probably, this assumption could be easily removed by assuming some, some, some mean flow in the zonal direction. Mm, some kind of Doppler shift to the solutions that we find. But the most easy, easy way to solve this equation is just to assume no basic flow. Then linearization is very simple because the nonlinear term doesn't give us any additional contribution, just vanishes. We assume that second order quantities are zero. Small compared to the first order quantities. All the other terms are already uh, linear apart from this equation where we get a 
get a contribution from the mean height. Um, and importantly, at the equator, we do this also in the mid latitudes, sometimes when we uh, look for solutions of these equations, um, we assume some kind of approximation of the variation of the Coriolis parameter with latitude. So we assume that the, the Coriolis parameter can be expressed as a, as a constant term plus something that linearly depends on the original direction. The thing is that this is a Taylor series expansion. This term at the equator becomes zero, the, the Coriolis term. So what we get is only a linear-dependent Coriolis term in our equations, no constant term. If we solve these equations in the mid-latitudes, we would, these raw equations as they are, where no filtering has been yet really applied to, um, then we, would, we, would, we could assume in that equation that that we can use here instead of beta y, we could use f0, because we can assume if we, are, if we remain close to our base point, then the, the Coriolis force is mainly uh, due to this mean term. In that case, we can also solve the equations. For the, for the mid-latitudes, we can solve these equations. And what the solutions are, are inertia, very fast-moving inertia gravity waves. With the, with the phase speed in this case, okay, the, the height of the medium and then plus F naught over K square F square so some kind of gravity waves modified by the, by the fact that the earth is rotating so in the mid latitude, these equations, uh, I, I could solve them, you know, everybody of us could solve them immediately by inserting uh, Fourier components here. Just uh, no problem. Immediately you could derive this. The problem here is, it's a, it's a slight problem, that this is a, a, a linear equation. We have linearized it, but the, there are no constant coefficients. Constant coefficients would make it very easy to solve these equations, which is the case for the mid-latitudes. But for the equator, it's not the case. There is this, this linear varying coefficient of this, of this independent variable multiplied with the velocity perturbations here. So this causes a problem to solve this equation immediately. But, but of course, we try to solve these equations in some ways. So, and uh, what turns out to be successful, I'm, uh, I, uh, I always, I'm, I'm not good at solving equations anyway, but you, know, um, you can dream a solution and try if it, if it solves your problem. So let's say we dream this kind of approach. We have an amplitude function that only depends on the original direction, and we have waves. We assume waves, sine waves, cosine waves, that move in the zonal direction. And this, this, if, you, if we insert this in these equations, it turns out to be a, a, good, a good approach. Because, as you, as you remember from basic uh, physics, if we... If we have derivatives applied to this, then if we calculate the derivative here with respect to time, we get the, we get the frequency down, and then the sine and cosine, they just repeat. And if we build the derivative with respect to x, we get the wave number, the zonal wave number out. We, we have only to, to, to uh, continue to use the derivative with respect to this uh, amplitude function. If you do this, so this is very straightforward. We get all the, for the time derivatives, we get all the, down from this approach, the i, nu, and then the amplitude function. We have divided by the, by the e to the power of i, and so on, to get this 
this equation for, the, for our amplitude functions uh, that only depend in, on the original direction. So again, in the mid-latitude, at this point, we would have been, the solution would have been there. We would have a dispersion relationship. In the mid-latitude, we would have this as our dispersion relationship, and we, have done, we are done. Here, we still have to do some work, because we have to solve this for our amplitude functions. We are not yet. This is not yet solved. But you can do some, some manipulation. You insert one equation in the other, and uh, yeah, if you do that, um, I should have some remarks here. Okay, if you do that, if you insert one and the other, here you get the set of two equations here. Now we try to eliminate between these equations the, the meridional velocity, no, the, 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 the height, the geopotential height, and just get an equation for V. But take into account that once we do that, we, so we, we divide this by, by this factor here and insert this in this equation there, so we bring this to the other side, divide this here. We have assumed that this is different from zero, okay? This is something that comes back later. So when, when doing this, when eliminating here the, um, the height field, we, is, we are assuming that this here, this uh, factor, is different from zero. And we get this second order differential equation for the meridional velocity. Again, this equation would be very easy to solve. It is, in fact, the, the solution for a harmonic oscillator. So we come back to our, we would be immediately back to waves, which is the solution that we can derive in the, in the mid-latitudes, if this factor is, uh, was, was zero. But with this factor, this equation, again, is, a, is an equation with non-constant coefficients. So we have, we have this problem again. And um, in addition, when, when, when seeking solutions to this, uh, mathematicians, um, of course, have to take into account that the solutions could, should decay away from the equator. The, the physical reasoning is that when, when, when doing our approximation, f equals f naught plus beta y, we, uh, we are assuming that, that our base point always remains close to the equator. So if we go too far away from the equator, this is not valid anymore, our, our assumption that our f naught is zero in principle. So we have physically, we have to, to look for solutions that stay close to the equator, or put differently, decay away if we go away from the equator. So therefore, these waves that we are looking for, almost because of, of, of how we, we pose our equations, are equatorially trapped. They have to, to decay away from the equator. So they should be equatorially trapped. Now, and this is something I, I have not proven, but clever mathematicians have shown that this solutions has only the, the solutions of this are only such that they fulfill this property. We can only find solutions that decay away from the equator if this if this factor multiplied by the scaling, essentially this factor here, fulfills that this is an, an odd number. So 2n plus 1, where n goes from, is, a, is, a, is a, some number. So this has to be an odd number. And this, actually now, is our dispersion relationship. Here we have the dispersion relation. Now we have a relationship that gives our frequency dependency on wave number. And this is what we know as dispersion relationship. There is still this parameter n, 
which in principle is still free to vary. This n can be can vary. And, and, and it turns out later that this n is a um, is the number of nodes we have in the in the original direction of our solutions that eventually decay, but before they completely decay, they can have some oscillations on the, away from the equator. So essentially, this is our dispersion relation. Now you do a trick, you do a transformation of a variable, so you introduce this new variable uh, zeta instead of y. And then the, the equation looks like this, where we have inserted that this bracket was, uh, was equal to this, this odd number in principle. And Again, it is, uh, this is often the case. Okay, this equation, thank God, has been solved already, because this is, equa this is the equation for the for the harmonic, simple harmonic oscillator in known from quantum mechanics. So the Schrödinger equation, in some ways, leads to this this kind of problem. So thank God, uh, people have solved this equation already, and. And the, the solutions that you find are given by what is called Hamid polynomials. So the, the solutions as a function of this scaled original uh, coordinate are equal to, the, to this Hamid polynomial, where for each n we can, we can find a different one. Um, times this, this exponential here. In fact, if you insert this approach in this equation for each n, this is the defining relationship for a Hermit polynomial. So if you for, for this hn, for the first one, for the zero term equal to one, insert this here, you will find then, yeah, that, 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 that is the solution, and so on. So this, inserting this here gives us the defining uh, property for, for Hamid polynomials. And the first few ones, you can iterate them as many as you, as you want. The first few ones uh, have this structure. The first one is just a constant. So for the, for the zero one here, where the Hamid polynomial is one, we get a Gaussian distribution around the equator. We get something that decays with a, with a squared of the original distance from the equator, a Gaussian, a Gaussian distribution around the equator. However, the other ones have some kind of before they decay eventually, because this exponential term will always give you, if you go far enough, a decay is, is, is dominating. But there's some, there are some polynomials that may change sign in between. So, so we, we are looking for the case n equal to zero. And because here we, we, we have to use something that, um, so n equal to zero means that we are looking for very, the, this, our original structure is very simple because we are looking for the simple Gaussian decay, which may be relevant in reality. Imagine we have some kind of, symmetric heat, ENSO-like symmetric heating at the equator, then that may force waves that you know, have not so much complex meridional structure, but have a very simple structure around the equator, and then decay if we go away from the equator, also because the heating goes away. So, so I guess that's a physical reason why this, this most simple case is probably the most relevant one. And so we insert this in, uh, in, in our dispersion relationship that we had above, and we can do a factorization. If you do some, some manipulation of this equation, we find that there is this uh, factorization. However, um, one root here that would give us uh, the phase velocity is equal to this negative um, gravity wave speed, like a westward propagating gravity wave, 
is not permitted because remember when we divided before, we have excluded that this factor was zero. That was here when eliminating, when eliminating here the, the height field, we have assumed that this is different from zero. <coughs> Therefore, the solution is simpler. We get just one. We just have to require, instead of this third order polynomial, we got just, just get this second order polynomial. And the solution is this. Already a quite complicated. From, from, this, from what are the ingredients in this, in this square root, uh, there's a beta, which is the related to the Coriolis force. And there is the, the g times h term, which is related to the gravity waves. So it's kind of, it's clear that we have a mixture of, of gravity and, and inertia and Rossby waves going on here. Rossby waves because, in fact, the, the beta here is, uh, is determining also the Rossby wave speed. Do you remember the, the phase velocities of Rossby waves? I guess this is all important, so. The phase velocities of Ross of, 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 of Rossby waves uh, in the extratropics. How do they depend on beta and the wave number? Do you remember that? They were equal uh, beta, sorry, beta over k square. So the highly dispersive are those waves. And and it turns out, okay, there we have. I've tried to equal k. G times H A. So essentially, if 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 K is uh, goes to zero, then this term becomes very dominant, and we get some in the end something like um, inertia gravity waves out of it. But if k is is relatively small in the synoptic size, you can you can show oh, here's a one. You can show that this term for synoptic type waves, like wave numbers. Uh, four, five, three, something like that. Um, you can show that this is a small term. Then if you... So you have something like one plus x here, okay, to the square root. If you then do a Taylor series expansion, you would get something like one half plus minus one half, one plus one half, of this x value, so that would be for beta k squared k e. Then okay, the positive the positive root. For the positive root, we can essentially then, since this, we assume that this is a small term, uh, this can be ignored, and, and we get something like a gravity wave, because this, this is determining, the, that would be the gravity wave speed for the positive root. So that would be the um, eastward propagation. For the westward propagation, the negative root here, this this one half goes out with this one half, and what is remaining is 
K E H E uh, that goes out so we get one half one fourth of four beta over k square so so to a first approximation this goes out this goes out we go back to our exactly to our Rossby rays phase speed so for for synoptic type wave numbers our our westward propagating waves at this at this for this simple equatorial solution are approximately again let's do it this way our if the same phase speed as our Rossby waves in the extratropics the same um, dispersion relationship that we can derive for our Rossby rays in the extratropics. Oh, sorry, yes, yes, because this is the frequency, so, so C is nu over K. Sorry, yes. Yes. So, it's a, so we divide this by the, by the wave number and then we get our phase velocity, which is the Rossby rays. So, so yeah, okay, that's, that's then interesting. So we get, we get this Rossby waves that propagate with the same phase velocity that we are used from the extratropics. We get these Rossby waves at the equator, equatorially trapped, and they move to the, to the west, just as our Rossby waves in the extratropics. One special case is the Kelvin wave. The Kelvin waves are usually the, the, the prototype for Kelvin waves we, uh, we find in the oceans. Kelvin waves are usually something that, is, that are very important in the ocean where we have borders. For example, the, the classical example of a Kelvin wave is if you have a bathtub and you, you create motion, you will find that the maximum amplitude of waves moving around your bathtub is at the border because there's some kind of the border in, induces convergence and at the border we get the maximum height of our perturbations and they decay towards the inner of your of your of the bathtub and move around that so this border gives us uh, a Kelvin wave type uh, behavior in the atmosphere we usually do not have borders but, interestingly, the equator acts for the atmosphere, at least in this property and for the dispersion relationship, as if, as if it was a something like a border. Okay, that, that's the interesting feature. So, however, there's a trick. In order to derive Kelvin waves, we simply assume... And this is, again, probably based on observational findings that this is a relevant case. If we set the original velocity exactly to zero. So for Kelvin waves, the original velocity component is exactly zero. And then we may find different solutions to this, to this equation. It becomes simple because this drops out, this drops out, and this drops out. So the, the solutions become much simpler, but we have assumed purely horizontal uh, uh, motion in the Kelvin wave. So good thing is uh, the set of equations really becomes now simple, so simple that even I would be able to, to solve this equation. Everybody would be able to solve this equation. So if we insert, if we eliminate now from this set of equations uh, phi between these two. So we, we build the derivative with respect to y here, and so this here, we get, we get this equation here. No. Yeah, we get this equation here. 
But if we if we derive this for yeah if we if we, if we, if we solve this for these two, then we get a, a, a relation for our for our original velocity for our zonal velocity. Original velocity was zero, but zonal velocity has some structure around the equator. And this structure we can derive by solving this equation. Again, uh, you can dream a solution. If I dream a solution, if I dream this solution, insert this here, I, uh, it, it can be shown that this is the solution. So again, we have a Gaussian structure around the equator, just as before for our simple Rossby wave solutions. Now, but now, before it was for the original velocity component, now, for the zonal velocity component, we find a Gaussian structure around the equator. But there is something here. Because from the dispersion relationship, this one here, this value C could be positive or negative because we take the square root. So it could be plus or minus square root of G times H. However, clearly if we, if we insert the negative C value here, then our, our perturbations in the, in the zonal velocity would not decay exponentially away from the equator, but would increase exponentially as we go away from the equator. So we have to exclude this solution. So there can only one, for Kelvin waves, there can be only one direction in which they can move, and this is eastward. So they, this has to be the positive route, which means eastward wave propagation. Equatorial Rossby waves, westward, Kelvin waves, eastward. And, and it's if also from this equation, it's probably useful to derive the distance from the equator for which uh, the waves become small. So let's say 1 over 1 over e, one, almost one third, the, the e folding distance with respect to the equator. If you, it just depends on this factor here. So if you, you can work out that the e folding distance is is this two c divided by beta, uh, the square root of this. Now we have to insert um, an observed value for c. And this is a trick here because, in theory, we know that for this case, c equals square root of, of the height that we have assumed. No one, uh, no one scientist can tell us how we should pick this height of our system. Uh, we use the trick, we eliminate it, and we just use the phase velocity, which we can derive from measurements. And if we use measurements for the phase velocity, we, we get an e-folding scale of about 1,500 kilometers. So the, the Kelvin waves decay quite rapidly if we leave the equator for, for the atmospheric case. This is, of course, depends on, on, on what, what problem we are looking at. Interestingly, if you, if you do it the other way around, you would say, so this is 30 meter per second. This is a typical uh, phase velocity we can derive for uh, Kelvin waves. If we square this, we get 9, okay, let's say 1,000. We divide this by 10. So the typical, our scale height would be 100 meter. I have no idea what the meaning of this height is, okay? There's a... So here's the problem. We cannot use any reasonable height in this, in this simple set of equations to derive the phase velocity of the Kelvin waves or Rossby waves or any of the waves. We have to use observed values. This is the caveat we get from oversimplifying our system in a way such that, okay, this, this height, yeah, um, it's not... Interesting. So it's actually quite intuitive. These are the these are two cases. For the, the upper one is the, is the simple K-wing wave. 
and here is a, is a, is a Rossby wave. For the Kelvin wave, it's actually quite intuitively from the motion in this wave to derive the phase velocity. It's very simple. Because these, these are the zonal velocities here, and these are the, this is the height perturbation, so negative height perturbation here, positive height perturbation there. And the velocity field, the zonal velocity field is such that it is maximum in these, in the, also in the centers of the, of the height field. But look at this, what would happen in this, in this region here? In this region here, we have a divergence of our flow. Divergence of the flow means that we lose mass there. That means that this low, or height in our simplified case, this low pressure that is sitting here will have the tendency to move over here. So that gives us an intuitive understanding for, the, for why carrying waves are moving to the east because the, the velocity in them is such that, the horizontal velocity field is such that it, it promotes uh, wave propagation in, the, in this direction. Okay, and then you can, of course, come back to, you can actually draw these dis dispersion diagrams, nu with respect to k, and for even for different values of n and so on, for our Rossby waves and for the Kelvin waves. The Kelvin waves in, in such a diagram are linear, give us a linear relationship because, because the phase speed does not depend on the, on, the, on the wave number. But the Rossby waves are more complicated depending on the, on the, on the original wave number and on the zonal wave number. They, they can have different, more complicated behavior. And of course, this remains us, this reminds us of our initial diagram. So that's the reason now you can interpret this diagram theoretically and say, okay, this, this increased energy that we see here fits to the dispersion relationship the linear dispersion relationship we can derive for Kelvin waves, and 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 yeah, it's not it's not so clear actually for the equatorial Rossby waves uh, because the, the the idealized line would follow here, but in this spectrum, okay, it's um, the real world sometimes can be more complicated, but in some ways they are following this this property, this phase uh, uh, this dispersion relationship for equatorial Rossby waves, in some ways. So, these waves now will be, on Friday I will give a second lecture on, on the ENSO phenomenon and the positive atmosphere and ocean feedbacks. And as you can imagine, the Kelvin and Rossby wave solutions, they play a fundamental, fundamental role of the adjustment of the atmosphere to a to ENSO phenomenon in the, ocean, in the atmosphere, but also in the ocean. We will, we will apply the same kind of solutions that we have applied here for the atmospheric case, because we have specified phase velocities that are valid more or less for the atmosphere, we will also use them for the ocean. And the, 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 the atmosphere and ocean adjustment, they work together. The wave adjustments work together in order to create a, a very interesting positive feedback. So the, the waves that we have derived here are crucial in setting up this equilibrated response because the waves are very quick. In Enso, imagine an Enso phenomenon will take uh, months to develop. If you, if you have followed the 2015 El Nino event, it has developed already in spring, maybe a little bit earlier, and it's still there. 
And if you look at, look at daily maps, it doesn't change so much. The waves that we have been looking at, within one day, they, they've traveled along, around the globe. So, uh, so this ENSO phenomenon is kind of providing a low frequency forcing for these waves. And we have to look how these waves equilibrate in order to provide some kind of feedback to this, to this ENSO phenomenon. And this is what we, what we derive in the, uh, in the lecture on Friday. Is this okay? Timing okay? <laughs> Do you have any questions that someone else then can answer? Someone who <laughs> understands more? Thank you. No question.